Howdy, y'all. Welcome back. Today, we are going to get into the astounding history of Memphis, Tennessee. First and foremost, before we tackle this significant piece of Southern America, we must allow ourselves to fully grasp what occurred in the Tennessee landscape before the documented arrival of European settlers. For this history, we will be looking at the oldest photographs of Memphis, Tennessee, and we will turn to the currently accepted narrative, which, believe it or not, appears to paint a picture which is still being misunderstood today. From the year 10,000 BC, large portions of the southern United States, including Tennessee, were inhabited by Paleo-Indigenous people. These Paleo-Indigenous people being the first humans to settle in the Americas following the last glacial period. The seemingly agreed upon yet often debated theory for the arrival of these first humans to America suggests that they traveled from what is today northern Russia, including the lands composing Siberia, crossing a land bridge which once existed across the Bering Strait, known as Beringia. In this theory, these hunter-gatherers followed the ancient big game which crossed the land bridge as the last glaciers melted. These first humans to America continue to arrive between the years 45,000 and 12,000 BC, according to this currently accepted history. As these hunter-gatherers began to adopt farming, and with the arrival of new forms of trade, these paleo-indigenous people of America amalgamated and then formed the archaic indigenous people of America, who dominated the Southern American landscape, including Tennessee, from as early as 8,000 BC through roughly the year 1000 BC. The archaic indigenous people began to form small settlements throughout the Americas, developing the trade routes which would become the paths that were later traveled by early European settlers centuries later. However, before these European settlers arrived to the southern United States, we have the final significant grouping of indigenous people who dominated the U.S. from roughly 1000 BC onward. Before European settlers arrived from roughly 1000 BC through the year 1500, the Americas were dominated by the woodland indigenous culture, an overarching term for a vast assortment of tribes who called America home. This included, in the area of Tennessee and most parts of the Mississippi River Basin, the Mississippian culture, also known as the Mississippi Mound Builders. However, do not let this name fool you. Large burial mounds earthen effigies and earth mounds, as well as entire earthen fortifications often associated with the Mississippi Mound Builders can be found as far north as Pennsylvania and New York. In some instances, these mounds served multiple purposes and could even be interconnected over large pieces of land. Many theorize that from these earliest mounds and the paths created to interconnect them between the cultures of early American indigenous people developed the sites which became the first major European forts and towns in America. In Tennessee, the Mississippi Mound Builders were known as the Tipton Culture or the Tipton Phase, which was a time period consisting of a large assortment of mounds and earthworks being created throughout Tennessee directly before European arrival. Interestingly, Hernando de Soto of Spain is documented as the first European to arrive to what is present-day Memphis, Tennessee, and this occurred in the 1540s. De Soto was believed to have documented what were the last aspects of the Mississippi Mound Builder culture. However, when the French arrived to the area of Memphis in the late 1600s, it was said to be occupied by an entirely new group of indigenous people, known as the Chickasaw tribe. Here is where we find another really interesting aspect of this narrative. In the earliest photographs of the Chickasaw people, and in artistic depictions predating photography from the 18th and even the 17th centuries, the Chickasaw are almost always depicted looking dressing and conducting business in a European-centric style. As we come to the earliest maps of the South, including a 1724 map of the tribes between Charleston, South Carolina and Virginia, the Chickasaw are not only labeled as the closest tribe to Virginia and the European settlers, 
but the Chickasaw are also a tribe which appears to be entirely separated from the other tribes of the South, having their only connection to trade being with the Cherokee, who would then conduct trade with the numerous other tribes of the South. The Chickasaw appeared isolated, as if they developed independently of the tribes around them. Adding to this intrigue is the mysterious history of the Chickasaw people who once dominated a large area of the South, including Tennessee. According to scholars, the Chickasaw arrived from the Western United States, traveling to the South with the Choctaw indigenous people. In the Chickasaw creation legend, the often pale-skinned Chickasaw are said to have been startled when their tranquil and isolated existence was interrupted by the Choctaw, who, according to this myth, emerged from a giant earth mound nearby the Chickasaw villages. As the darker complexion Choctaw intermingled with the Chickasaw, their community together grew to immense proportions, leading to the tribe elders ordering the two tribes, now one, to move east past the Mississippi River. Here, the elders believed a great new landscape would be discovered. And according to the Chickasaw creation legend, this is when the Chickasaw and the Choctaw reached the abandoned mound cities of the Mississippi Mound Builders. Once in this new landscape, their new founded home, we're told the Chickasaw and the Choctaw again went their separate ways. We're told by the late 1600s, with the arrival of both French and English colonists, trade routes were quickly established. The Choctaw who often captured other indigenous people, apparently began selling these indigenous people into slavery, a practice that was overwhelmingly common at this time. The Chickasaw, who were said to have not committed this practice, also quickly traded with the European colonists to gain European arms, which they then quickly used to battle the Choctaw and end the practice of selling captured Chickasaw to the Europeans. However, when the Europeans also armed the Choctaw, the conflict between the Choctaw and the Chickasaw continued well into the early 1700s. As the Chickasaw unified with the British and the Choctaw with the French, the two sides continued to battle in Tennessee and the surrounding lands well into the mid-1700s. During the Seven Years' War, the Choctaw were mostly expelled from the Chickasaw lands as the British defeated the French. However, by the American War for Independence, both sides, Chickasaw and Choctaw, were said to have fought on the side of the United States of America. Fort Prudhomme was built near present-day Memphis by the French to defend from the Chickasaw in the mid-1680s. This fort predated Anglo-American settlements in Memphis by well over 70 years. The French again fortified the area around Memphis before the year 1739, culminating in the French Campaign of 1739, where the French used Memphis as a base of operations against the Chickasaw. Fascinatingly, according to this narrative, despite these early outposts, the land comprising present-day Memphis remained a largely unorganized territory through most of the 18th century in terms of European settlement. In the year 1790, promotion of a town at Chickasaw Bluffs was undertaken with leases offered by one John Rice. In 1796, out of the rapidly evolving Carolina colony, the site of Memphis, known then as Chickasaw Bluffs, became the westernmost point of the newly admitted state of Tennessee in the newly independent United States of America. With the Jackson Purchase of 1818, the federal government of the United States officially purchased the area of Memphis from the Chickasaw Nation, opening up the area for development and European settlement. Memphis was founded by a group of investors headed by President Andrew Jackson and James Winchester of the famous Winchester family on May the 22nd, 1819. It was officially incorporated into a city in the year 1826, named Memphis. We are told the name Memphis was chosen 
based off the name of Memphis, the former ancient capital of Egypt along the Nile River. Memphis itself, the Egyptian title, comes from the name Menefer, a pyramid complex associated with the pharaoh Pepi I. The founders of Memphis, Tennessee, planned for a large city to be built on the site with possible Egyptian-style monuments and laid out in a plan featuring a regular grid of streets interrupted by four massive town squares. Three of the original four town squares of Memphis exist today as public parks. In the 1830s, Memphis was also the main departure point for the Mississippian Native American cultures, which were forced to leave their lands for reserved indigenous territories in what is now known as the Trail of Tears. Multiple times throughout the 1800s, the state of Mississippi attempted to claim Memphis due to boundary complaints. However, none of these attempts were ever successful and Memphis remained one of the most important cities in Tennessee. By the age of steam, Memphis became one of the hubs of steamboat travel and development. The cotton economy of the antebellum South depended on the forced labor of hundreds of thousands of people, and Memphis had one of the largest slave populations in the South. Prior to the end of the Civil War, one-fourth or 25% of the population were enslaved people. Seeking their freedom, Memphis also became a main station for the Underground Railroad, with the still-standing Jacob Burkle House, also known as Slave Haven, being the entrance to the escape route to the north. In 1857, the Memphis and Charleston Railroad finally linked the ports of the Atlantic Ocean with ones on the Mississippi River, this time in Memphis. Through the railroad, Memphis traders could export cotton through Charleston, South Carolina, to London, and to the rest of the continent. In 1861, Memphis became the easternmost terminus of the Butterfield Overland Mail Delivery Service from California. Tennessee also seceded from the nation in June of 1861, briefly becoming a Confederate stronghold. However, on June the 6th, 1862, just one year later, Memphis was captured by the Union during the massive Battle of Memphis. The city remained under Union control except for one single incident, a massive and dramatic raid undertaken by Nathan Bedford Forrest, in which Nathan and the Confederate troops stormed the Gayoso House Hotel, built in 1842, which was serving at that time as the command center for the Union in the area. After a short time, the Union regained control. Thousands of slaves with families fled from rural plantations in Memphis to the Union lines, and the army established a contraband camp south of the city by 1865. After the war, there were 20,000 free African Americans in the city of Memphis, a near sevenfold increase from the 3,000 before the war. By 1866, during the early days of Reconstruction, the Memphis Massacre of 1866 occurred from May 1st through May the 3rd. During this time, a majority of the African American community in Memphis was targeted by the European settlers, resulting in the passing of over 45 freed men and the destruction of nearly all the freed men's homes and businesses. This incident was heavily underreported in the United States at the time and led to a somewhat dramatic decrease in African American population in Memphis. By 1870, out of roughly 40,000 residents who called Memphis home, over 15,000 of them were African American. On July 24, 1866, Tennessee was the first southern state to be readmitted to the Union. The Memphis Cotton Exchange, one of the largest in America, opened in 1873, led by Napoleon Hill. The Yellow Fever ravished Memphis in 1873, 1878, and 1879. During the outbreak in 1873 alone, over 2,000 people in Memphis lost their lives due to the Yellow Fever, the highest fatality rate of any inland city in America. When the yellow fever reappeared in 1878, over 25,000 residents, or over half of Memphis, left the city in just under two weeks. Most would never return. Before the outbreak of 1878, the population had reached nearly 50,000 people, 
After the outbreak, the population had dwindled down to only 19,000 residents, with over 17,000 of them documented as coming down with a case of the fever. The yellow fever then again broke out in 1879, in which several hundred more people passed away and thousands more left the city. Amazingly and devastatingly, the narrative continues by telling us that so many people passed or fled Memphis during this epidemic that in 1879, Memphis lost its status as a city and officially went bankrupt. Memphis, from that point on, was then governed by the state of Tennessee as a simple taxing district until the year 1893. The first bridge across the Mississippi into Memphis was founded in 1892, and Memphis began to rapidly regain power. Construction of the Memphis sewers began in January of 1880, and by the year 1893, they had expanded to over 50 miles of quality sewer lines. Robert R. Church, a freedman of Memphis, made a fortune going around to towns and cities that were devastated by the fever, which were then mostly abandoned. This is where Church would purchase up the properties for pennies on the dollar. Church is known as the South's first African-American millionaire and was the first citizen to buy a $1,000 bond to pay off the debt and help restore Memphis's charter. He founded Memphis's first black-owned bank, Solvit Savings Bank, ensuring that the black community could get loans to help establish businesses and buy houses in Memphis. Because of the drop of the European population in Memphis, minorities gained new opportunities not often seen in other southern states at the time. In 1897, as a conspicuous claim to its revival, Memphis had built a massive Egyptian-style pyramid for the Tennessee Centennial Exposition. By the year 1900, Memphis had developed into the world's largest spot cotton market and the world's largest hardwood lumber market. From the year 1900 through 1950, the population of Memphis increased fourfold, from roughly 100,000 residents to nearly 400,000 residents. In 1916, the world's first supermarket chain, Piggly Wiggly, began operation in Memphis, created by Clarence Saunders. Saunders' original mansion, now known as the Pink Palace, is currently owned by the Memphis government, serving as Memphis's official museum. The infamous Peabody Hotel opened in Memphis in 1923 and became one of the most well-recognized symbols of upper-class Southern elegance. During the Second World War, the War Department constructed a massive depot in Memphis. By the time it closed in 1997, the Memphis Army Depot had 130 buildings on a site with more than 4 million square feet, all considered enclosed, fortified industrial space. Meanwhile, in 1942, the United States Navy built the Millington Naval Air Station, just a few miles north of downtown. This 3,500-acre facility provided pilot training during World War II and later became the major naval air technology training center for aviation special training. The first national motel chain, the Holiday Inn, was founded in Memphis in 1952. By 1960, Memphis was a hub of the South, becoming a center for the growing music of the Southern United States. Such musicians as Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, B.B. King, Isaac Hayes, Al Green, and more modern performers like Justin Timberlake and even the great Aretha Franklin would call Memphis home. In 1962, Danny Thomas founded the St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. The city of Memphis also played a critical role in the civil rights movement. In 1968, the Memphis sanitation strike broke out, with workers urging the public to demand better living and working conditions for the disenfranchised citizens of Memphis. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. arrived to Memphis shortly after the strike began, giving his prophetic and most well-known I've been to the mountaintop speech from the Mason Hotel in Memphis. The very next evening, April 4th, 1968, King lost his life 
at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. In 1973, the FedEx Corporation, then a somewhat small company, moved its base of operations to Memphis just two years after originally opening in Arkansas. As Memphis developed as the major hub of operations for FedEx, the Memphis International Airport became the largest air freight terminal in the entire world. In 1974, Harold Ford Sr. of Memphis was elected to Congress, becoming the first African American elected to a national office in Tennessee. His son, Harold Ford Jr., also served as a congressman. By 1980, the population of Memphis had exceeded 645,000 residents. However, by 1990, this population had decreased to just over 610,000. By the year 2000, Memphis again surged to over 650,000 residents, a number that it sits around today. Memphis's first business district was known as the Pinch, and it encompassed all of Memphis north of Adam Street from the river to 3rd Street, and is known as Memphis's most historic district today. Now, remember earlier when we talked about the mound builders as well as the practices of the early indigenous people of Memphis? Consider that, and then consider this. The very first neighborhood in America said to be built exclusively by and for freedmen was known as Orange Mound in Memphis. Orange Mound was developed on the grounds of a former plantation beginning in the early 1890s. It provided affordable land and residences for the less affluent. The Orange Mound neighborhood also provided a refuge for African Americans moving to the city for the first time from other rural areas of the South that were not so inviting. Today, the Memphis and Shelby courtroom in the Benjamin Hooks Central Library provides facilities for researchers to view items from Memphis's history, from the archives, as well as its manuscript collections. A majority of the amazing photographs we have viewed today come directly from these most important and historical societies of Memphis. Howdy y'all. If you enjoyed this video, if you viewed these amazing photographs, and if you felt impacted by any of the images or any of the information that was presented to you, I would first like to say thank you so much for joining me today. Second, I would ask you to please like, share, and subscribe to my channel to find numerous other videos relating to photography, relating to the old world, relating to these beautiful photographs throughout our history. Third, and finally, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts and opinions about today's video on Memphis in the comment section down below. I thank you immensely for helping the channel to grow over the last few years and for helping to expand your own minds while contemplating the concepts of our not so distant past. And I can't wait to speak with you on the next video. See you soon.